much. Um, so, so just so you know, Suchicha, we have 90 minutes and um, that's three quarters of an hour plus three quarters of an hour or an hour plus half an hour as you wish with questions. Okay, I think um, I'm happy to take questions as I'm speaking. So should we just sort of um, let yeah. people ask questions while I'm speaking? So that will probably be simplest and then we'll go however long it goes. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, excellent. Um, so yes, thank you uh, everyone for being here and thank you to the organizers um, for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to give something of um, an overview of this um, very, very new field of Fermi surfaces and unconventional insulators. Um, I'll mostly talk about um, the discovery, but I'll also um, give a brief update on other groups which are now finding more examples of Fermi surfaces in unconventional insulators. All right, um, so to start with, um, just because we probably have um, um, audiences of um, possibly students as well, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview of different insulator types um, before we get to the new kind of insulators we've been um, studying so that um, there's a bit more context about what you would expect for conventional insulators and why it is that um, what we observe is starkly different from any uh, previous examples of insulators. Um, so as everyone's familiar with, so I'm just gonna get this out of the way. Yeah, so as everyone's familiar with, um, essentially the hallmark of an insulator is a gap um, between say the conduction and valence band or hybridized bands, or in some way, the fact that the Fermi energy lies in a gap and it's not in the middle of a band, which is the characteristic of a metal. And so what this means is that the characteristic signature is um, resistivity that goes up as the temperature goes down um, for an insulator in contrast to a metal where the resistivity goes down um, as the temperature goes down. So this is just, you know, very, very, um, basic level of the expectation for an electrical insulator compared to an electrical metal. Um, and I'll just briefly go over the different uh, examples of insulators, which you're probably familiar with. Um, and the case of a band insulator, in this case, it's insulating and the Fermi energy lies in a gap, uh, quite simply because the valence band is filled and then there's a gap um, to the conduction. Uh, band. So we don't need to think about correlations for this. It's a question of band filling and the Fermi energy is in a gap uh, for this reason. Um, and quite a few of the topological insulators, the weakly correlated ones, we think of them more starting from a band picture. Um, you're also prom probably familiar with MOT insulators. Um, and in this case, the gap between the lower Hubbard band and the upper Hubbard band is because of strong correlations and a strong Coulomb repulsion. So in this case, one has a half filled band. And um, so you can see the filling, uh, yeah, you can see the filling uh, is now half filling here. And if there were no correlations, if one had half filling, one would expect a metal because you would expect the Fermi energy to be halfway through that band. But instead you have Coulomb repulsion and this causes a separation between the low and upper Hubbard bands. And that's what gives you a uh, band gap in the case of a Mott insulator. And um, another slightly more complicated case, and so as you see here in the case of a Mott insulator, uh, when you increase the Coulomb repulsion, it goes from what you would expect for no correlations, you would expect the Fermi energy to be in the middle of a band to give you a metal and associated Fermi surface. Whereas if you go towards um, higher and higher uh, Coulomb repulsion, the separation between the low and the Harvard a higher Hubbard bands grows, and that's why the Fermi energy is in a gap. Um, and slightly more complicated is the case of under insulators. Um, and the main thing you need to know here is that the gap between uh, the bands in this case is because of hybridization. Yes, yeah? so it's a different kind of gap formation. Um, and this is also uh, largely driven by correlations. So here, um, the conventional case of under insulators is where you have a flat F band, so largely localized F band and a dispersive conduction band, so say a D band. 
And when these two hybridize, you have a separation between FD hybridized bands, and there's now a gap between uh, the two hybridized bands. So whereas for the conduction band, the Fermi energy would have intersected this band, we no longer have this conduction band. Instead, we have two hybridized bands and the Fermi energy lies in the gap between these bands. So all these are different ways in which one can get electrical insulators with uh, an electrical gap. Okay, and so what is of um, primary concern to us in what I'm going to talk about today is that in the case of electrical metals, as I mentioned, uh, the Fermi energy cuts through the band. And so one has what's known as a Fermi surface, which is essentially um, the locus, uh, momentum space locus, where there's an intersection between the Fermi energy and um, the band. And whatever geometry that momentum surface has, that is the Fermi surface. So of course you have different metals, complicated metals, correlated metals, uh, multi-band metals. One has many different crossings of the band of the Fermi energy, and one has um, possibly multi-component, but certainly um, a finite Fermi surface of different types, which is considered a signature of each type of metal. In contrast, as I just mentioned, in the case of an electrical insulator, one has a gap between bands. So the Fermi energy lies in the middle of this, which means that it doesn't intersect any of the bands. So if you're looking for the momentum locus of where the Fermi energy intersects, uh, and there is no such intersection. So there is no Fermi surface. So the first signature we spoke about for an insulator is that the resistivity goes up as the temperature goes down in contrast to a metal. And the second signature is that there is no Fermi surface for insulators. So these are not um, considered particularly profound. These are considered very, very fundamental expectations for a metal and an insulator. Okay, um, so now um, I'm going to talk about, um, yeah, um, the material, in which we first did these studies, and I'm going to spend most of my time talking about this and then update with um, uh, more recent things that our group and other groups are doing. Um, so uh, the first material we worked on was samarium hexaboride, um, and it's largely studied in high magnetic field laboratories um, in Tallahassee principally. Uh, the crystals are chiefly uh, floating zone growth crystals from the University of Warwick. Um, these are my students and collaborators at Cambridge and um, multiple other universities. Okay, um, so in the case of samarium hexaboride, yeah, okay. Um, so in the case of samarium hexaboride, um, just to uh, make contact with the band structures I spoke about earlier. So um, if we look at the right hand side figure, um, the red dots are where one would have the conduction band. So as I mentioned, pre-hybridization, if one didn't have hybridization, one would have the red dots and get the conduction band, which the Fermi energy would intersect, you would get a Fermi surface. Um, however, because um, this is actually a condo insulator, the way one gets insulating behavior in this material is that these localized F bands in yellow here are hybridized with the um, D band, um, which is in red here to give the hybridized blue bands, which you can see there's a separation from the Fermi energy. And as a result, one does not expect any Fermi surface or um, any intersection of the Fermi energy with um, the band structure instead one expects a finite gap insulating behavior and the absence of a Fermi surface. Um, and the reason this came into prominence more recently, uh, let me try and advance. Yes. Okay, so the reason this came to prominence more recently is um, work by um, peers and collaborators, which um, postulated that samarium hexaboride was a topological insulator 
instead of a normal insulator. And just very briefly, without going into much detail, um, the signature of a topological insulator is that in this case, um, one has a special kind of a gap, which has to do with hybridization, however, to do with spin up and spin down for any uh, so, uh, bands, in which case the result is that only the surface of the material is conducting, whereas the bulk of the metal uh, material is insulating. And so this is another category um, of insulators that has um, come into prominence much more recently, but samarium hexaboride is unique in being a correlated um, example hypothesized for such a topological insulator, which is why we started studying this material, because we wanted to see if we could see the Fermi surface associated with this conducting surface. So the expectation here is that um, one has surface states which do have a Fermi surface because these are gapless, while the bulk of the material is insulating. So one wouldn't see a Fermi surface and the chief behavior of the resistivity is that associated with an insulator. Um, and so this is initial work um, by uh, Jero, uh, San Galitsky Coleman, postulating that Samarin hexaboride is a topological insulator. And here is some of the preliminary work that um, uh, provided possible evidence for this as a topological insulator, given the fact that when the material is thinned, um, the surface uh, resistivity or the surface conductivity um, stays the same, but the bulk resistivity changes. Um, and as a result of that, one has the ratio um, of the resistivity at low temperatures, and this is the surface resistivity, to that of the bulk change as the thickness of the sample is changed. And that was one of the um, signatures one would expect for a topological insulator. So this is the reason we initially started studying this material, because we were curious about whether we could see the Fermi surface of um, the conducting physical surface of this material, uh, which is distinct from the insulating bulk, which we would not expect to show a Fermi surface. Um, so given that it's particularly important for the bulk to be an excellent insulator, um, we chose to study floating zone grown crystals um, at the group of Warwick. And so why this is important is that this is not grown out of a metallic flux. Um, so there's several um, very, very good um, crystal growths um, that have been done using metallic flux. Um, but if you are to grow an insulator, especially you do run the risk that any contamination by metallic flux will give you metallic inclusions that you um, could um, confuse with that coming from uh, the bulk of the material. So instead we choose to use floating zone crystals um, that are grown solely from Samarium boron at very high temperatures. Um, this is uh, congruently uh, melting material. So um, this can be grown largely without too much additional uh, cell flux of either Samarium or boron. Um, we then, um, so this is a big bowl of this material, so it's several, um, I guess, inches um, in length. We then cut pieces from the single crystal and then do very, very extensive screening procedures. So to get maybe five or 10 uh, crystals with a high value of um, resistivity ratio at low temperatures to high temperatures, we would characterize or my students in my group would characterize about um, maybe close to 100 crystals to get maybe five that we would test in uh, high field magnets to observe quantum oscillations given that the best crystals are those with um, very very high resistivities of the bulk so where this value goes the highest um, and that's our criteria for determining what the most pure single crystals are uh, which show the best insulating behavior. And so you can see here that um, when crystals are deliberately made impure by a small fraction of um, gadolinium by uh, the group of um, uh, Terrell McQueen, I believe, you can see there's a drop of several orders of magnitude of insulating behavior. So it's becoming more metallic. Um, you can see that flux prone crystals are somewhere in between. Um, they're not too bad, but they do show maybe 10 to the three. Um, resistance ratios. And of our crystals, they bounce around somewhere between 10 to the 4 and above 10 to the 5, 
And so we only pick crystals to measure uh, in high fields, which have a resistance ratio of above 10 to the five to make sure we're excluding as many uh, dislocations or any impurities in the gap as possible. Okay. Um, so when we put this in a magnetic field, you can see the magnetic field has very little effect. So the blue line here is the resistivity at zero Tesla. When we apply 45 Tesla, and this is also quite unique to Samarium hexaboride, that very high fields, even up to 100 Tesla, actually don't metallize uh, the system. They barely change the gap by maybe 10 or 20 percent by 100 Tesla. Um, implying that the G factor is probably very small because the Zeeman effect seems to be doing very little to this material. So at 45 Tesla, we're confident it's still um, a good insulator. And um, if we were to try and attribute amine free paths to it, um, the electrons are barely moving. Um, so you would associate something like 10 to the minus 15 meters, which means that this is very far from a metal. The electrons are largely in place, except for very small movements. And this is just a fit to the activation gap, which is about 30 Kelvin. OK, so given all that to you know, make you confident, this shows properties of an electrical insulator. We then start trying to look for quantum oscillations, as I mentioned, motivated by the fact that we were trying to see what the Fermi surface of the conducting surface of a possible topological insulator would be. So we go to Tallahassee, use high magnetic fields up to 45 Tesla. Um, these screened single crystals at low temperatures down to dilution fridge temperatures um, and using torque magnetometry. So just to give you um, a very, very um, a brief outline of torque magnetometry. So this is an example of a crystal mounted on a beryllium copper cantilever. So this is flexible and the plate you see below is fixed. So um, the magnetization of the material gives you um, a certain torque when a magnetic field is applied. And as the magnetization changes, um, N cross eight changes and magnetic torque changes. And so this uh, upper flexible cantilever deflects and the separation between the base plate and the flexible plate um, changes. And if we me measure the capacitance. So these are coax cables going off to measure the capacitance. So the separation between these two plates changes. And we're talking about very, very small amounts and deflections of like fractions of a radian. So this is an extremely sensitive measurement, um, but that is well designed not to pick up any of the vibrations of high magnetic fields, which is why we can pick up very sensitive quantum oscillations. Um, okay. So the first thing we look for is resistive oscillations. Um, and if you think a bit about it, it will make sense that if we're expecting only a fraction of the sample, the surface of the sample to be conducting, we would not expect uh, a property sensitive to the entire volume of the sample to show oscillations. Rather, you would expect something that sees the conducting parts like the resistivity to show oscillations. So we try measuring um, SDH, Shubnikov de Haas oscillations. Um, we search for, I don't know, several months. Um, we don't see anything and we decide we can't make any conclusions from this one way or the other about whether there is a conducting um, surface or not, because if you don't see oscillation, that doesn't mean there's no Fermi surface. It just means maybe uh, the amplitude is too small for you to see. So we're sort of winding down at that point, deciding we can't make a conclusion. Um, at that point, we decide to do magnetization just to see what the magnetization does, um, not expecting to see what we saw, which was very large amplitude quantum oscillations against the background of magnetic torque. Um, so nothing has been subtracted here. Yeah, so this is um, just the magnetic torque, as I mentioned, which one obtained. So if there was no sample, you would see um, a quadratic, or well, if there was a paramagnetic sample, let's say you'd see a quadratic um, and the, versus H if you had a, a linear um, uh, M in H. And so one sees a roughly quadratic background, but one sees hugely um, prominent um, quantum oscillations on top of it. Um, and I'll show you in a bit, these are periodic and inverse magnetic field, which is what we would expect for uh, lambda quantization. 
Um, so yes, we are extremely confused at this point about how we're seeing such big oscillations in a material which the bulk is um, clearly insulating. Um, um, but one of the things that actually makes it convincing that it's not from um, a tiny pocket or a tiny inclusion is that not only do we see low frequency oscillations, so this frequency is a few hundreds of Tesla, but we also see, so if you blow up at high magnetic fields, so now a background has been subtracted, uh, we see high frequency oscillations, and this is now um, over uh, 10,000 Tesla. So what this means is that it appears as though the electron executing cyclotron orbits, um, which require mean free parts of about 10 to the, to, to the minus eight micro, uh, meters. So I told you before that the resistivity is so big that the mean free path would only be about 10 to the minus 15. So something has gone wrong in our understanding. There's about uh, a million times difference between what quantum oscillation imply, the electrons are traveling in terms of cyclotron orbits and mean free parts, and what the electrical resistivity seems to show in terms of electrons are stuck in one place. Um, I'll come to what this might mean, but right now, this is just an empirical observation. Um, so this is showing you- um, oh, Just as a point yeah. of principle, if I can interrupt, yes. I mean, you don't know it's the electrons. It's not electrons yes, that return absolutely. Distribute. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I agree, Sabir, which is why I said, I'll come back to what it might be. I totally agree. Um, it, if we were, so naively from typically if we saw oscillations we would associate it with electron like quasi particles but if we were to do that there's this massive dichotomy between this apparent mean free part which means something has broken down and indeed it could be the assumption these are electron like quasi particles which is the assumption which is not correct i totally agree um okay so um, we're just going to look at some more of uh, the measurements so that you can be convinced that um, this signature is pretty prominent and we need to try and understand what it is. Um, so this is a different angle um, of the same crystal and you can see um, now low frequencies, but also on top of the low frequencies, prominent high frequencies down to quite low fields, which get bigger at high fields. So if I show you the FFT at low fields, um, it's uh, pronounced at about 500 Tesla and at the higher fields end, it's pronounced at about um, 15,000 uh, Tesla. So the highest frequency implies a Fermi surface occupying almost half the Brewon zone, which is sizable, which is why it seems like the electrons are executing large cyclotron orbits, which leaves something to be explained clearly. Um, and this is some more data taken at a different angle, and this is just blown up so you can see the very highest frequencies. And this is different field ranges, so you can see there are, so sorry, this is a Fourier transform as a function of inverse magnetic field, which um, basically we do because this is lambda quantized and the oscillations are, well, they appear to be lambda quantized, they're periodic in one over B. And so we take a Fourier transform in one over B, you get very sharp peaks, which is consistent with the inverse B um, periodic behavior. Okay, um, so the large size of the oscillation seem to indicate it's a bulk Fermi surface, um, but we do a more quantitative comparison to check this. And so what we do, so we take the capacitance and convert this using various spring constants of the cantilever into Bohr magnetons per unit cell. Um, and so we see that, okay, if the volume of the sample um, were contributing to this material, what would, um, how many Bohr magnetons per unit cell would these oscillations correspond to? And we get something to the order of 10 to the minus three Bohr magnetons per unit cell, if this is coming from the entire volume of the sample. And that's reasonable when you look at if Lifshitz Kosovich theory were to hold good, what would you expect for if you take a theoretical estimate and say, okay, for this um, size of Fermi surface, what would you expect to be um, the Bohr magnetons per unit cell? And you would expect about 10 to the minus three. So at least you know, within less than an order of magnitude, it's reasonable. And this is regardless of the geometry of the Fermi surface. So if it was more like a sphere, if it was more like um, 
a cylinder, this is regardless of that, you would still see about 10 to the minus three. Um, in contrast to if we were to associate these oscillations with the surface, it would be about a million times less volume just because it's a few unit cells, which would mean that each unit cell would have to contribute a few hundred Bohr magnetons. So you just take 10 to the minus three and you multiply it out by say a million. So each uh, unit cell would have to contribute a few Bohr magnetons to give you these big oscillations. And that is not consistent with anything we're aware of. It's not consistent with lifshitz kosovich for sure. And it would be extremely startling if you got such a high um, contribution from each um, unit cell. Um, it's also the case that other groups have done measurements of the mobility of the surface, which is very, very poor. So it's also the case that it's unsurprising uh, to some degree that we didn't see resistive oscillations is probably because the surface is very uh, has very poor mobility, which also then would be very strange if we got prominent quantum oscillations from a disordered surface. Um, the other check we do is uh, angular rotation. And this again can tell you the geometry of the Fermi surface. So if one had a cylinder, so a 2D Fermi surface, um, which was not isotropic, but change from a small cross-sectional area to a cross-sectional area of infinity along the axis of the cylinder, then clearly when we rotate the magnetic field direction, the area um, of the Fermi surface would change dramatically. And actually probably what I should have warned you about is that the frequency of the quantum oscillations. So I'm just gonna go back to um, just for people who aren't familiar with this. So the frequency of the quantum oscillations is a measure of the Fermi surface area. So the slower the um, oscillations in one over B, the lower the frequency, the more rapid the oscillations, the higher the frequency and the bigger the Fermi surface area. And if you have different frequencies, that means there's different cross sections of Fermi surface. Um, so if one rotates the magnetic fields and expects the area to change um, with uh, angle, that means that the periodicity of the oscillations will change. Example for a cylinder in a cosine-like way. Okay, um, so this is now the quantum oscillation frequency as a function of uh, magnetic field angle. Um, so you can see that not much changes with angles. So this is just a regular scale and um, it's not a log scale. So you can see that nothing much changes. We're looking especially at the highest frequency oscillations. Um, whereas if one were to have a cylinder as you would expect, so a 2D Fermi surface as you would expect from the surface, you would expect that when the magnetic field is parallel to the long axis of the cylinder, the area would pretty much go to infinity because there's no intersection. So the area would go to infinity, one would see a cosine-like depends and the area would be shooting or basically you would stop seeing oscillations beyond a certain point, which is not what happens. You see a largely flat angle dependence of the frequency, which is consistent with a more or less isotropic uh, spherical burning surface. Um, the other thing to point out is that I can't actually back calculate and get a geometry from just the frequency because that requires, um, that would be over parameterized basically. So, what I'm trying to do here is actually look at examples. Ordinarily for a metal, one would have uh, a band structure. One could calculate the Fermi surface and say, let me compare the calculated Fermi surface with the observation of frequency, which I can't do here because if one were to calculate a band structure, it would be zero. You would see nothing here, no frequencies. So instead um, we notice something interesting and we notice that um, the frequency depend well the frequency size and the angular dependence um, is somewhat unexpectedly similar to that of lanthanum hexaboride, which is the conduction electron counterpart of the samarium hexaboride. So this is where, as I spoke about right at the beginning, one has hybridization. So the F hybridizes with the D. That's what gives you a gap. In the lanthanum hexaboride, the F electrons are gone. So all you have is a conduction band. So the hybridization gap is gone as well. So you just have a conduction band, the Fermi energy crosses it and one has these um, isotropic Fermi surfaces. Um, and really interestingly, they have a similar frequency and a similar angular dependence 
to what we see in the Samarum hexagoride, um, which seems to imply that somehow the Fermi surface of the Samarum hexagoride seems to be in some way remembering the conduction electron Fermi surface it had before it got hybridized. Um, yeah, so this is just um, to- Question, yes? if I may. Yes. So how does the resistivity of uh, lanthanum hexaboride compare with samarium hexaboride? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it's down here on the right. Sorry, I should have pointed to it. So it's that of a very good metal, right? So it doesn't go down. Uh, sorry, it doesn't go up as you would expect for an insulator. It goes down. Um, and we have measured oscillations in the lanthanum hexaboride. They're very, very... Um, uh, large amplitude and the mean free path is very high. So it's essentially a very good metal. So much larger amplitude than samarium hexaboride, the oscillations. Um, the oscillations are higher amplitude than samarium hexaboride. It's slightly difficult to do a like to like comparison um, because of just the differences in the specific crystal we're studying. Um, the amplitude is bigger than samarium hexaboride. It wouldn't be say several orders of magnitude bigger, um, it is more prominent than in samarium hexaboride, yes. Okay. Um, yes, so as I briefly mentioned, as I showed you earlier, hybridization between the conduction and um, uh, F-electron bands of the samarium hexaboride gives you a gap. So what our collaborator, Michelle and Johannes, has done to try and uh, simulate a Fermi surface in the samarium hexaboride is to manually lift the Fermi energy, so to take, so make the Fermi energy cross the band. And she's had to shift it by a few electron volts. And in that case, yes, one does have now the crossing of the band by the Fermi energy, and she can simulate um, bands by forcing it, uh, forcing the Fermi energy to cross the band structure. Um, but basically, that's just giving you back the conduction electron Fermi surface. And so um, our starting point, so the lines we have here. So the black lines here and the red lines I showed you before, are essentially showing you simulations from, if I were to take the same geometry as lanthanum hexaboride or the samarium hexaboride shifted band structure and simulate that, that looks not too dissimilar to the frequency versus angle in the measured hexaboride. Okay, so um, at this point, I'll talk a bit more about how can we get a Fermi surface in insulator I'm going to talk more about where um, we know it doesn't come from. What the actual answer is, I am not going to be able to give you an answer. We don't yet know. So I'm going to talk much less, like almost um, not cover what are possible models to get a Fermi surface in an insulator. And hopefully in the discussion time, if theorists are interested, um, we can talk about that. This talk is going to be almost entirely empirical. So I'm just going to talk about empirically what can we rule out. Um, so firstly, we um, one of the possibilities suggested is what if it comes from a metallic inclusion? Um, so we look at uh, the most likely possibility, which has been looked at by uh, the group of Terrell McQueen and Colin Rohum at John Hopkins. So they deliberately dope the sample with a percentage of uh, gadolinium. And if it's doped to the percentage of gadolinium, one now picks up this magnetic behavior um, in the magnetization. So one would see uh, a bigger magnetization and this um, uh, curvature just from uh, a launch of a fit. Um, what we find in our crystals is very, very small, a uh, very small component. We can put an upper bound as 0.02%. Um, rare earth um, contribution, and it's basically the same as an isotopically pure um, samarium hexaboride with no rare earth inclusions. Um, it was also shown in the same study that when there's doping of gadolinium, the heat capacity goes up substantially, um, whereas we show that the crystals that we measure um, have a low but finite linear heat capacity of about two millijoules per mole Kelvin squared, which is even lower than the isotopic materials measured by the group. Um, the other way we have to probe locally whether there's any inclusions is our collaborator Vesna Mitrovic has done NMR um, on these materials. And there's a whole separate result about the fact that one over T1T is finite. It looks like metal, but I'm not gonna cover that here. Um, and Vesna will be able to talk more about that. But what I am going to point out here is that the line widths of uh, the boron 11, which she studies are extremely narrow. 
So this strongly argues against an inhomogeneous distribution within the material. So it means one of two things. Either the material is completely homogeneous and there is no impurity distribution or very little uh, impurity distribution, or it's completely impurities which are homogeneous. But if it was completely impurities which are homogeneous, one would get metallic behavior, which one doesn't. One sees very good insulating behavior. So the conclusion is that there are minimal, there's no observable inhomogeneity in the material which argues against any of these patches of metallic inclusions, which um, could conceivably give you um, some small oscillations. Um, we also are very careful to do um, mass spectroscopy, which is a bulk measurement of the material to see what, uh, put a bound on any impurities. Um, and the method is able to put a bound at the limit of detection of almost um, all possible um, inclusions and up to the limit of detection of everything, the rare earths are uh, below um, 400 ppm or even below that. This is just the limit of detection. And um, yeah, so one can see clearly from here, there's no evidence for any inclusion, certainly not at the level at which one would see large Fermi surfaces. Um, the next possibility is that there uh, is a viable possibility that maybe these oscillations are not associated with a Fermi surface, but they're just associated with electrons jumping across the gap um, at the Fermi energy. And so the other possibility is some kind of low energy excitations that exist um, that somehow couple to a magnetic field, but don't have any signatures in the electrical conduction, which is of course the conundrum I am not sure there is a clear answer about how to get this, especially quantitatively. There are proposals which we can talk about, um, and I think they come down to a question of at which order do they couple to the magnetic field, at which order do they couple to the electric um, field. So that's one possibility. However, before we get to that, we think of the possibility of um, can one just have a gap and no um, low energy excitations, but still have the electron jumping across the gap. Um, I'll show you the equation a little later on, but just for now, uh, <clears throat> the main point I'm going to make is that for such a case where there's a gap and electrons jump across this gap, one would expect the quantum oscillation amplitude to plateau uh, at low temperature. So roughly the size of the gap, below the size of the cap gap, you don't expect quantum oscillations to keep growing in amplitude. You expect them to flatten or decrease. Um, so in this case, actually two things happen. So if I look at high temperatures, the oscillations definitely keep growing. But when we go down to the millikelvin range, they start growing even more rapidly. So this is a log, uh, no, this is not a log scale. This is a linear scale. Um, so the oscillations grow lipschitz kosovich like down to about one Kelvin. And then below that, they start growing even more rapidly. They certainly don't flatten or decrease. And so this is just showing um, the extent of growth. So if I benchmark it to, um, the lowest temperature, you can see there's a rapid growth at low temperatures. And I'll show you the formula in a few slides to show that this is inconsistent with a gap at the Fermi energy. It is most closely consistent with a gapless uh, low energy en uh, excitation at the Fermi energy. Um, we can also do a very rough back of the envelope calculation and say for this size of Fermi surface, um, these are very light masses we measure from lifshitz kosovich so you get roughly masses of about one or 0 0.2. Um, the density of states would be about four millijoules, which is not too dissimilar from the linear uh, heat capacity um, that is observed. So this was actually observed much, uh, several decades ago in the 1980s or 1990s um, by groups that were studying it at the time who commented there appears to be this finite linear heat capacity. We don't know where this comes from. Maybe it's from many body effects, which basically means we don't know where it comes from. Um, so we're revisiting the same unexplained finite linear heat capacity that was seen several years ago. But now we're saying, well, it's possible that this finite linear heat capacity could be consistent with the density of states that we're seeing from uh, corresponding to the Fermi surfaces. Okay, so this is just a summary slide for the samarium hexaboride. And if I didn't tell you anything else about this material and I just showed you these oscillations, 
um, one could come to the conclusion, yep, this is consistent with a metal with this Fermi surface and light electron masses, which is consistent with a conduction electron Fermi surface. What is the conundrum here is that the electrical resistivity is consistent with that of a good insulator. So where are these oscillations coming from? And I'm not going to try and answer that question. Um, I'll move on to the next material in a bit. So I can take questions on this and then move on if anyone has questions. Any questions? Uh, I have one, if I may. Yes, Ravas, um, please. Yes. Uh, Greetings, Suchitra. Hi, uh, hi, th th Thank you for the inspiring story. Uh, but uh, it, it seems that, I mean, th there have been several occasions where uh, in, in different materials, oscillations are either seen in the resistance and, and not seen in, in, in the magnetic moment oscillations or the other way around. And uh, could you gauge your, your story with respect to these occasions? Oh, right. Um, so I guess there's a few reasons why that might happen. So um, for so, so, so one, um, so different techniques are, uh, are sensitive to different parts of the Fermi surface. So ordinarily, so I think most of the cases you talk about are probably in uh, metals because until this um, finding almost, well, all quantum oscillations were reported in uh, bulk metals, uh, bulk uh, semiconductors, um, et cetera. Um, so I think if one had a metal of some kind and you saw different frequencies with different techniques, um, one would conclude that different asp uh, aspects of the Fermi surface were being picked up by different techniques. For instance, differences in curvature, um, differences um, in the mass uh, um, of certain uh, components. In this particular case, um, it's true that it does seem a bit surprising that there's no evidence for quantum oscillations in the electrical resistivity. Um, I don't know if that is part of the strangeness of this material, um, but it is true, right? It is true that we're working with a very insulating material. So I think we shouldn't be overly surprised that the quantum mass in this material may have some other reason for not showing up in the electrical resistivity. We could also invoke things like what I mentioned about um, the mobility is quite poor, especially at the surface of the material. Um, and the bulk, well, the mobility isn't just poor, it's an insulator um, in the bulk. So um, I think if one were to look at a metal, then yes, one could say, um, yeah, maybe one could explain it because of various aspects of the Fermi surface, different techniques are more or less sensitive. I think in this material, we should probably be more open to the possibility that there's some more profound reason connected with the origin of the quantum oscillations that are causing it not to show up in the resistivity and in the electrical resistivity and only show up in the um, magnetic torque, which, yeah, it is, it is, I guess is coupling in a different way that is not so so you know some of the theories that have been proposed would for instance postulate that maybe um, there's a transverse conductivity which may be conducting while the longitudinal conductivity isn't and we're measuring the longitudinal electrical conductivity but um, yeah I think we need to think of such possibilities when we're thinking about why that might be so. Hey, Thank you. There's a question in the chat, Suchitra. Um, so I can't see the chat right I can now. Read it to you. I can read it to you. So, yeah. how many fundamental frequencies are there in the FFT spectrum shown? Oh, um, well, I think um, most of them are fundamental. I don't think the quantum oscillations are. Uh, hello, can I ask directly? Yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah. First of all, thank you so much, ma'am. That's a, that was a very nice talk. So uh, actually, what I was just trying to ask is that uh, from my experience of uh, working on the nodal line semimeters, like model-wise calculations, I know that uh, for some materials like ZR, SIS, uh, the Fermi surface is just like a torus at low energies, and then if you ha you have 
two uh, fundamental frequencies and then in the effective spectrum you get two peaks so like compared to that like uh, i see that here the fermi surface is quite sc scary looking so in this case uh, how many uh, fundamental frequencies will be there right so i think this comes back to the fact that it looks like a metal but it doesn't look you know like <laughs> good enough a metal to give you many harmonics so i we haven't identified more than perhaps the 500 tesla uh, frequency might have a harmonic at a thousand tesla but beyond that um these frequencies so maybe there's some harmonics so you know the lower the frequency the lower the main free path needed so possibly the oscillations in a few hundreds of tesla there might be some harmonics hidden in there but beyond that none of these have harmonics none of these are harmonics so you you can okay. look at say the angular dependence or the mass mm -hmm. or where the oscillations show up and the size of them and they don't track to give you something that's like a multiple so yeah most of it is not harmonic okay no but actually as I'm, i was saying like uh, the harmonics are there but other than the harmonics there are there will be some different fundamental frequencies uh could be there right yeah, like so, depending so on the how are, many so these are them i mean i don't want to give you a number but you can count off here right so each of these is a fundamental frequency okay 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 thank you so much yeah okay, okay. Hey, um so chicha we have a question from sky from gonna mower we'll come and ask you now Hey, um, hey, hey. I have a question just to better understand uh, the basic physics of this magnetic torque that you're probing here. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that I usually associate with sort of magnetically anisotropic materials, right, that want to align themselves preferentially in some directions. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, this Fermi surface looks fairly uh, homogeneous and so, right? I mean, so can you, I mean, do you have some intuition as to why actually you see a torque or is it just overall? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. If it was a perfect sphere, you wouldn't see torque. So you're correct. And so we can do fits to the ellipticity and it's slightly elliptical. So if you look right, for instance, here, so you can see here, it's not a perfect sphere. It's actually elliptical. So yes, if it was a perfect sphere, you would not get magnetic torque, you're correct. But the torque technique is very, very sensitive to small anisotropies, which is what we're picking up. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, any more questions? Anyone in the room here? In which case, the tutor, I suggest you continue. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Okay, um, so this material I'm going to discuss in less detail because I talked through the main physics, but there are, I think what I'll talk about mostly for the Euterbium boron 12 is um, the differences from the samarium hexaboride, which it, it, it's interesting to note. Um, so these measurements were done both uh, at um, the Hyphy lab in Tallahassee and in Dresden. Okay, yeah. Um, so again, this is an example of a condo insulator. In this case, um, there are two conduction bands that cross the Fermi energy. So the one here around the X point and the one here around the W point. And so what this means is one has a more complex Fermi surface. There's still a gap at the Fermi energy, but if we were to think of what might the conduction electron Fermi surface be, it would be more complicated. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to jump ahead because by this point, you know the drill. Um, so we measure magnetic torque, and this is in the insulating state of YBB12. Um, the gap is pretty similar to samarium hexaboride. It's a few MeV, and so we see oscillations in the magnetic torque. You'll notice here the oscillations are low frequency, and we don't see high frequency oscillations. Um, so we see uh, oscillations in the magnetic torque. This is about a few hundred Tesla and a high frequency um, at about 800 Tesla. And we see similar frequencies in the electrical transport in the insulating state. Um, and we look at it as a function of temperature. And so um, the main difference in the case of YBB12 is that the frequencies we see are lower. There are a few hundred Tesla and the masses are higher. 
Um, they're up to about eight electron masses in the insulating state. Um, so this is interesting, and I'll come to this in a moment, because this is reflecting a Fermi surface that doesn't appear to be the large light conduction electron Fermi surface. So it's interesting, maybe there's different origins of the unconventional Fermi surface in these different materials. Um, okay, so this is the formula I promised earlier in the semester of hexaboride about how we rule out gapped low energy excitations. Um, so what we've done here, so the equation at the bottom, so the first bit, um, so if you know about um, quantum oscillations, you'll be familiar with the first part of this equation. So what this is doing is um, the expected size of um, quantum oscillations and X has a factor of temperature in it. So this is um, the ratio of quantum oscillations in a gap state, which is mg, so the size of oscillations in a gap state compared to the normal state. So um, if there was no gap, then this would drop out completely and just get conventional cinch x by h, uh, x behavior for the normal quantum oscillations, which um, probably um, you might be familiar with, which shows why quantum oscillations uh, grow as the temperature reduces. Uh, this is just the lifshitz kosovich form. But what we've done here, so one can take either, say, uh, the Noel Cooper, sorry, I don't have a citation here, but there's quite a few papers with similar proposals. So specifically for this material, uh, for this family of correlated insulators, um, Noel and Cooper have a model in which they have a finite gap at the Fermi surface, but similar models have been worked out, say, in the type two superconductors by Miyaki et al., for instance. Um, so in these models, a little delta is the gap here. And so we expand out what the additional damping would be or temperature dependent factor would be in the case of a gap system. So you can see here that what happens is that when one has a finite gap, and so delta is about 10 here, which is, um, um, yeah, pretty much what you might expect for this um, material, you can see that there is no growth. So this is how quickly is it approaching the zero temperature limit. So um, if there's a high slope, it means that it's growing rapidly approaching low temperatures. And if you just see something flat, that means it's flattened and it's not growing at low temperatures. So you can see that if there's a gap, you expect it to be flat and not grow at low temperatures. As the gap size is reduced, you start seeing it begin to grow at low temperatures until for the gapless state, the growth takes off more rapidly at low temperatures. And so we do a quantitative comparison. So the dotted line here has uh, no variable parameters. The only variable parameter is the mass, which we've used to fit the regular LK. So it's seven uh, electron masses. So there's no other variable parameters. And you can see clearly that it's growing as you go to low temperatures, as you would expect for a gapless system. It looks nothing like what you would expect for a gap system. And I think this is actually a metric. So I think the reason this kind of comparison hasn't been made before is that one looks at quantum oscillations in metals. And if you see a growth in the amplitude as the temperature goes down, automatically fit LK to a gapless system. It's only in this case where we start doubting the fact that it is gapless because that seems so strange. And we say, could it have a gap? Well, it could have a gap and still give you quantum oscillations. But the way you can tell whether it has a gap or not is whether it keeps growing at low temperatures or whether it flattens at low temperatures. And both for um, quantum oscillations in electrical transport, so you can see um, the growth at uh, low temperatures and the the gapless simulation and magnetic torque, you can see that there's rapid growth as you go to low temperatures, which is consistent with a gapless model and which get, uh, rules out a gapped model. And uh, for Samara hexaboride, I didn't show this because the growth is even more strange. It's not even lifshitz kosovich like but I could do that down to one Kelvin and we would see the same behavior. Um, in this case, we can go down to about, yeah, about 500 millikelvin and say, okay, the gap, if anything, has to be below 500 millikelvin. Um, whereas in the Samara hexaboride, we can go down to 30 millikelvin and say, it's gapless down to 30 millikelvin. So this model is ruled out as well. Um, 
Okay, so, so I'm back to YDB12. Um, in this case, we try doing the same thing where we say, oh, does it look like a conduction electron on surface? We look at the lutetium boron 12. It looks nothing like the lutetium boron 12. So we measure quantum oscillations in the lutetium boron 12. Um, so we see um, prominent quantum oscillations, which have high frequencies, similar to the lanthanum hexaboride, right? Because this is now a conduction electron on the surface and you would expect a light mass. Um, so this is pretty much similar to what we saw for the SMB6. This is not what we see for the YBB12. So it seems like maybe there's a different mechanism that's giving the Fermi surface in this case, because it's giving you a small, heavy Fermi surface, and not a large, light Fermi surface corresponding to a conduction uh, electron surface. Um, we, in the case of the YBB12, it does get metallized above um, 50 Tesla. So unlike the case of the SMB6, which shows no sign of metal, um, the magnetic torque and uh, electrical resistivity sharply change at around 50 Tesla. And you can see the quantum oscillations become much more prominent here. And so this is now in the metallic state, which we know and love. And um, so in this state, again, we look at the amplitude as a function of temperature. And interestingly, we still see small heavy masses, uh, so small frequencies and heavy masses. And so what this shows is that um, even when the metal becomes metallized, it hasn't lost its hybridization, which is very unlike the SMB6 case where we were getting these large Fermi surfaces, which were light in this case, even in the metallic case. So it looks, so again, it's interesting because what it looks like is the insulating state Fermi surface is in some sense mirroring the unhy uh, sorry the hybridized um, heavy mass um, metallic Fermi surface that we access at high magnetic fields. So these are the metallic um, Fermi surface sheets from around 500 to about 3,000, and masses from about 8 to about 14. And we can make a comparison. Yeah of the insulating phase, which shows low masses, uh, sorry, low frequencies and high masses. There's some overlap of these low frequencies and high masses, but it goes on to much higher frequencies and higher masses. Um, so it could be just that the amplitude has grown and we're seeing more of the same Fermi surface. It seems to be that the Fermi surface is actually growing as we go to the metallic state. The reason being that I come to them that the heat capacity actually increases when we go into the metallic state. So gamma grows as we go from the insulated to a metal, implying that we have acquired new Fermi surface sheets that are still hybridized as you go into the metallic state. Um, yeah, so it looks like in the metallic state, <laughs> the small heavy masses we see could just be from uh, the magnetic field, which now causes uh, the bands to cross the Fermi energy and now we start seeing, so nothing happens to the hybridization. They still hybridized bands, but now the Fermi energy crosses the hybridized bands and we see um, a complex small mass. So this would also make sense for a semi-metallic Fermi surface because if the Fermi energy is just grazing the bands now, you would see small heavy pockets, which is what we see in the metallic state. Um, okay, so now I'm just gonna finish with a few slides. So um, what, is now um, sort of taking a life of its own that this whole family of materials, which we call unconventional insulators. So we showed you all these types of insulators with different properties. What I've shown you here is a new type of insulator, one in which the electrical resistivity goes up as the temperature goes down, as you would expect for any other insulator, electrical insulator. However, what is unique to this type of insulator is that the bulk insulating, um, um, yeah, the bulk insulating behavior of these materials um, is um, contradicted in some sense by the bulk Fermi surface that one sees from quantum oscillations in these materials. So the way we're defining this new class of unconventional insulators are materials in which the bulk is insulating, yet where one sees a bulk Fermi surface, and this is not a property of any other insulator seen before. So in topological, you had bulk insulating behavior conducting surface and surface Fermi surface from this conducting surface. Here we say 
okay, we don't know what's happening to the surface, but one has bulk insulating behavior and a bulk Fermi surface associated with this bulk insulating behavior. And this is a new class of unconventional insulator. Um, more recently, there have been more examples of this, which is quite um, exciting. So um, very recently, the group of NP um, Ong has um, reported bulk quantum oscillations in another unconventional insulator, alpha ruthenium trichloride. And um, uh, again, with all these different classes of materials, right, you can have many different types of um, materials and behaviors within this class of material. And it seems as though maybe there's different types of Fermi surfaces in each of these materials. And so in this case, again, you see um, good electrical insulating behavior. Um, in this material, this has been studied for quite a while. It's been hypothesized as a spin liquid in this intermediate field range, six Tesla and 12 Tesla. And this is the range in which quantum oscillations have been reported. Um, so they are reported to be most prominent in the intermediate field range where uh, the spin liquid is seen. And they're also reported to have fairly low frequencies. So this is a temperature dependence, um, fairly low frequencies of about um, hundreds of Tesla and masses of a few electron masses. So in some sense, um, it's, um, yeah, it seems like the Fermi surface and the field dependent properties of each of these materials is quite different. So in this case, the amplitude dies beyond a certain magnetic field. Whereas for instance, in the YBB12, it became a metal and it grew beyond a certain magnetic field. So the core to all of these materials is the unexplained phenomenon that one sees quantum oscillations, bulk quantum oscillations within a bulk insulator and I think we still need to get to the heart of this mystery and then try to understand the ways in which we have multiple different type of manifestations of this behavior in these different types of materials. We have a um, question, Patricia. Yes. From, um, so, well, um, I guess I can ask, have magnetization oscillations been seen in ruthenium um, chloride? That's a, very, that's a very good question, uh, not to the best of my knowledge. Um, um, we um, haven't looked at this material, so I can't. Talk, I, I don't um, have any knowledge. I don't know if they've been looked for and not seen. Um, um, I think, though. So sorry, just to add a clarification. I think, though, that one of the challenges would be the field range. Right? This is a sort of um, low field um, field range that these oscillations are reported to be largest in. And as you saw earlier, the oscillations grow with um, magnetic field. So I expect one of the challenges will be seeing large enough oscillations at these fields, um, just, just to explain why technically it would be challenging. But yeah, they haven't been reported yet. Um, okay, and another material in which quantum oscillations have been reported in the bulk is um, the insulator tungsten ditellurate from the group of Sun Feng Wu. Um, and yeah, so this is a more complicated device that's been fabricated um, in these materials and um, it can be tuned from a metal to an insulator. And so this group is looking in the insulating phase and they call it a large gap topological insulator. Um, I guess it's not like a huge gap, but it, it's reasonable. It's a few hundred MeV. So both in the ruthenium trichloride and this material, which is the um, tungsten ditelluride as well. So I think in the ruthenium trichloride, one of the points that has been made is that the gap in this material is much bigger than a few MeV. It's now like a few hundred MeV. So this gapless, uh, sorry, gapped argument for electrons jumping across the gap becomes even less tenable in this. So that's clearly not the explanation for uh, the quantum oscillations. And um, similarly, in the tungsten ditelluride um, as well, um, the gap can be tuned to a fairly um, large gap. Um, yeah, I guess around um, 60 MeV. Um, but yeah, so they see quantum oscillations in this case, the resistivity that they have reported and um, they associated with the bulk. So this is a very low quantum oscillation frequency, I guess. Oh, here are Someone asked about harmonics, I guess. Um, they report these to be harmonics. I'm not sure if I would identify them as um, frequencies, 
But I think the main um, thing they're reporting is very low frequency um, in this in one over B quantum oscillations with a fairly light mass. Um, uh, there are more examples. So uh, my group and other groups have found quantum oscillations in other examples of bulk insulators. And the really interesting thing is, it seems that every material has some quirks. So it's sort of, you know, like in the beginning of when oscillations were discovered in heavy fermions. Initially, it was a big shock that there were quantum oscillations in very heavy fermion materials. And then soon it became, oh, this is now the norm, but each material does something different. And so it seems that every bulk insulating material in which oscillations are now being reported seems to have different quirks about it, which is what makes it interesting to study. But I think at the heart of it, we still need to get to the heart of the mystery of why are we seeing bulk quantum oscillations in bulk insulators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satricha. Let's, uh, so we've had lots of questions and we have time for more. And I see Sabir has started us off here. So please, Sabir, um, unmute and ask a question. Hi, Sajitra. Um, I, I'm, I may have lost, uh, you may have covered this, um, but in ytterbium boron 12, yes. what is the phase diagram and what happened? Are you saying that as a function of magnetic field, it's for some field rate, it's an insulator and then it's a metal? Yes. So, so do you see like a jump in the resistivity or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't have the resistivity shown here. Whoops, sorry. Um, yeah, this is um, sort of the inductance, but yes. Yeah, so at this field where you see a sudden change, if I were to show you the resistivity, it basically um, drops and becomes zero beyond this field. Okay, and is this, do the quantum oscillations have a sudden change at that field? Yes, they become much bigger. So in this range- But the same much, frequencies. Um, you start seeing higher frequencies beyond that range. So um, two things happen when you go into the metallic phase. There's a bit in between we can't access because everything is changing. Uh, non-monotonically. But on the left, on at lower fields where it's insulating, you see low frequencies and high masses. Then there's a small gap in field. And then beyond that field, you get much larger amplitude quantum oscillations. Those have a few overlapping frequencies with similarly high masses, but also higher uh, frequencies with higher electron masses. I don't think I've shown it here, but um, yeah, I suppose I should have. Um, I can show you that the value of gamma in heat capacity rises dramatically from about two to four to about, or actually maybe from about five to about 50 on either side. So in the insulating phase, it's about five uh, gamma. And in the metallic phase, it's about 50. So it seems like it is acquiring more uh, heavy Fermi surface sheets as it goes into the metallic phase. Okay, so if I stick to the insulator, then yes, since you also made an analogy with ruthenium chloride, so a possible theoretical model, and of course, you know, we don't know yet, could be that these are spin-on Fermi surfaces in the in the insulator of ytterbium, ytterbium boron twelve at least. So these are the f electrons that are somehow mixing with the conduction electrons once you go in the metallic phase. That's that's sort of what you're implying. Um, <laughs> I'm staying clear from uh, implying models, but um, I think that, yes, that is a proposal that is, well, I suppose one wouldn't call it exactly spin-ons here because, um, so this is, yeah, I guess- In the insulating it. phase. So in the insulating phase, yeah. well, okay, one model, which is, of, okay. you know, at least in the class that I, yeah. I, I'm familiar with, yeah. You have an insulator where there's a Fermi surface of spin-ons, which are fermions that carry spin but don't carry charge. Right. And then and then and these are primarily F-like. Right. They're most, right. Uh, the spins are spins fluctuating yeah. on the F side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you go to the metal, okay, the, you have a metal insulator transition sure. and uh, then you're uh, mixing in conduction band modes and even the F electrons are becoming actual right. electrons rather than being yeah. spin-ons. So, uh, yes, I see what you mean. Yes. So the heaviness would be more consistent 
with F electron. Yeah, I think that um, the point you're making is, yeah, it, it is reasonable that in this case, it seems like these have more of the F electron character as opposed to say the samarium hexaboride, which had very light masses, which seemed yeah. to have more production. Right. Okay, that was kind of my point. I mean, so looking at this, you know, ethereum boron 12, okay, it seems like a cousin of ruthenium chloride where also you can make a similar model. Uh, sorry, yeah, ruthenium, or was it? Ruthenium, whatever, the, the ong data. But samarium hexaboride just seems like a totally different thing, which I, at least I can't place it in any model that I'm familiar with. Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, yes, fortunately I'm not a theorist. I don't have this problem is all I can say. I can just report it and say, I don't need to be constrained by a model. But um, I mean, I guess, yeah, Piers is probably here. So I don't need to mention, uh, Piers can talk about why your model, you might expect that. Oh, uh, sure. I'd love to hear that, but I guess this is, uh, well, I'll let the others ask those questions. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think in, say, um, Piers' Myrana fermion model, he would expect the Fermi surface in the insulating state to be that of the conduction electrons. Um, okay, so, well, I'd love to hear Piers, if you have further comment. I mean, there was an issue with the Myrana fermion. There were actually superconducting phases, at least in the early versions. I presume that not an issue anymore in the new version. <laughs> Would you like to answer this? Please come up. <laughs> Hello, Subia. You forced me to uh, come on. <laughs> um, so, uh, actually, there's a, a, a wonderful story here which involves Subia himself. Uh, because uh, in the early 1990s, uh, working with uh, Alexei Svelik and Eduardo Miranda, we were fascinated by the linear specific heat in samarium hexaboride. And we made a small model, uh, uh, a mean field theory in which we fractionalized the spins, to use the modern jargon, uh, as Majorana fermions. Uh, we, wrote up a, a, we wrote up a small paper on this. We sent it to a, to a proceedings of a SCARES conference that year. And I proudly uh, presented a poster about this uh, at the Gordon conference that summer. And Subia came along and he said, well, that's very nice, but you've broken gauge invariants and you've obviously not got an insulator, you've got a superconductor. And, uh, and we looked at what we had, smacked ourselves on the head, went back and calculated the superfluid stiffness and lo and behold, it was finite. And so that's the last you, saw at that point of us talking about this being an insulator. So 20 years later, what caused us to reverse our course? And, and the, the answer was, well, uh, we went back, we, we tried to come up with a lot of conservative explanations of smear and hexaboride. Uh, uh, we worried about alumina, we wor worried about, about the possibility of metallic breakdown of the condo insulator. Um, we worried about uh, um, we worried about spin liquids, possibly having some diamagnetic property, um, and then we were approached by Baskaran about our old paper. We started worrying uh, maybe maybe the superfluid that we had didn't have topolo the topological uh, uh, the topological protection of a conventional superfluid, uh, and. Uh, in a conventional superfluid, you can wind up the phase as much as you like, and the uh, wound up phase won't decay because it's topologically stable. And when we looked again at the model we thought about in, this, in the 90s, it didn't have this topological protection. We worried about it then, and we started thinking, well, that would mean that the supercurrents would decay. And the question then arises, well, how fast will they decay? If they'll decay very slowly, then you'll have a kind of strange metal. If they'll decay very rapidly, then you'll have something resembling a, uh, an insulator. Uh, and so we wrote a paper of working, working on the latter principle. Um, and so what's the update on all of that? Well, we're, st we're still quite perplexed about the whole issue. Um, uh, the Majorana Fermi surface that we have in the system uh, doesn't couple to charge, 
It doesn't carry uh, a magnetic moment, so it's not spin-ons, uh, but it does cap couple to the vector potential, and it even has a, li a even has a, a kind of linear coupling there in some circumstances. So we're still working on this on this problem, uh, and I think we would say that we don't have a theory for Smeramex aboard at the moment. Um, but but we would say that what you're seeing here is a system that does seem to show strong Landau quantization. Uh, and one of the questions we've had, and we posed it to Sachitra, is down to what frequency does the transverse conductivity, which is finite in the terahertz, continue? And we don't know the answer to that question. It's a fascinating possibility that this system might actually have a transverse conductivity at very, very low frequencies. Uh, if you like, it's, its response to a longitudinal and transverse electromagnetic field may be fundamentally different. And we're exploring that possibility at the moment. That's my long answer. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Piers. <laughs> okay, we, we have another question in the chat from um, Sachiaki Carr. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question yourself, feel free to do so, or I can read it out. Okay, okay, I can do that. Yeah, actually, the question I'm just reading, so I'm just asking that if there's an oscillating field, Let's say you have a, some uh, DC component, and with uh, with that you add some alternating part, and then uh, so that there are some lambda levels, they will be just fluctuating with time, and then there can be a possibilities of uh, transitions of electrons from one level to the other level. So with that, uh, change some uh, uh, very important way to the quantum oscillations. What we generally see in such system. This is like a general question. Oh, um, so somehow you want to couple to the Landau levels and make them new? Yeah, so yeah, my magnetic field variation is like some oscillating magnetic field variation. So you have, let's say, the constant part, DC part. And then on top of that, you have some alternating variation. So let's say some, some B naught plus B sine omega T. And then uh, because, of, yeah. because of that, you... So because of that, you can have those uh, labels coming close to each other uh, periodically with time. And then there can be transitions of electrons from one level to the other level. So because of these extra processes, uh, will there be some non-trivial changes in the quantum oscillation scenario what the system uh, had? I mean, I'm guessing the periodicity won't be 1 over V anymore. It will be some more complex function of the thing you're seeing. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a possibility in some scenarios. I'm not sure if it would be relevant here for some reason, but um, if one were to have that, I suppose one might have. Um, the conductivity will change, right? Well, I mean, more than the... Why would the... Conductive. You mean? I mean, the, I, oh, do you mean because of the transitions, quantum oscillations because they're jumping from Landau levels. I don't. I still don't understand your question. No, the con the quantum oscillations is there because you're varying the magnetic field, and then uh, the usual way, the way the quantum oscillations occurs, it will occur, and then now because uh, because now there can be transition between the le levels. So, how will that? change the overall picture, like uh, how important is... I think... It's... So of course the constant periodicity will be maybe hampered uh, with one yes. over B. Yeah, I mean, that's the main thing I can think of. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm sure you can work this out, right? I mean, you just change... Okay. I, yeah, I, 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 just, I, I just asked it. Yeah, I, I think the periodicity will change. I am not sure there will be um yeah something else that's particularly relevant to this is important okay okay thank you so much i just wanted to have some your view okay thanks hey so teacher we have another question in the chat which i think is partly addressed to peers actually i aditya um, panegrahi if you want to unmute and ask the question yourself you can do or i can read it out Okay, the question is, how can one understand quantum oscillations in um, ruthenium chlorate, which is proposed to be a Kataev spin liquid, 
does it mean that somehow the Majorana fermions are Landau quantizing? So, um, I mean, I guess um, Subir can also address this. So I think it, what Subir was mentioning earlier is the, um, is a model, is a potential theoretical model, I think. So what Subir was talking about earlier is the spin-on model, right? Where um, one, one has F electrons that are decoupled from the conduction electrons and the spin-on uh, Fermi surface can give you quantum oscillations. I think the challenge with all these models, as far as I know, is how you can get them to couple to the magnetic field and not the electrical field. So I think, so from my understanding is that, yes, there have been models for spin-on Fermi surfaces proposed. However, when we first um, reported bulk quantum oscillations in a bulk electrical insulator, um, there was um, no theoretic, there was no immediate theoretical model that seemed to be able to explain it. And I think this is still true for the spin-on model because sure, one can have a Fermi surface from spin-ons, but you need something more to see quantum oscillations. You need the Fermi surface to couple to a magnetic field and for the magnetization to show. And if it did couple to the magnetic field, which of course it did, uh, it can, then why would it not couple to the electrical field? And I don't think this conundrum has gone away as far as I know. So I think there are different versions of neutral um, Fermi surfaces or neutral low energy excitations. So the Majorana fermions Pierce spoke about is an example. The spin-on Subir spoke about is an example. Um, but I think all of these have the same challenge about how are these Fermi surfaces coupling to a magnetic field to give you quantum oscillations without coupling to the electrical degrees of freedom. Can I make a few comments here? Yeah, 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 of course. Okay. So uh, I, here's one way to think about it. So you, so you have these emergent particles uh, and with these fractionalized particles that are coupled to an emergent gauge field. Now it's important that it be a U1 gauge field for this argument to work uh, rather than Z2, which is what typically happens by our fermions. Uh, so, if you, so there's a U1 emergent gauge field which tracks the external gauge field. Now one place where we know this happens, where this kind of theory has been amazingly successful uh, is the Jain theory of the fractional quantum Hall effect. So in Jain's theory, there are some emergent composite fermions which see a much weaker field. So there's kind of the opposite thing. You apply a field and then the internal field, the emergent field cancels the external field uh, to make a much weaker field. And so you get a description of the fractional quantum Hall effect of composite fermions in a much weaker field. So, so that's, I would say, the most spectacular example of a very similar phenomenon. Now, you just take the same idea and apply it here. Uh, you, have, you apply an external magnetic field, and that induces via some coupling for the right type of uh, spin liquid, it will induce an internal gauge field. And, and the spin-ons are oscillating in the internal gauge field. Okay. So I remember I asked Patrick Lee this exact question um, quite a while ago. And I think because um, there's a paper by Motrinich which talks about something uh, maybe yeah. similar. And I think the question or the conundrum at that point is, okay, that's fine. Maybe you will get an emergent magnetic field, but why would it be the same as the applied magnetic field? Because the periodicity we see is one over B in physical applied magnetic field. So why would the emergent magnetic field exactly track the physical applied magnetic field to give you something? So I, I think what I would expect for an emergent magnetic field is oscillations that are periodic in that emergent magnetic field. And I don't know why that would also be periodic in the physical magnetic field, unless they're exactly the same. Well, I, I don't know what you mean by exactly the same because you have to normalize them with some charge, but they're proportional to each other. Uh, you know, uh, there is no charge, electric charge on the spin-on. So the whole normalization is tricky, but they're certainly proportional to each other. Uh, you can argue that. And that's, uh, and uh, I mean, okay, that, that will certainly give you one over B behavior, but it, the period itself and how to relate the period to the size of a Fermi surface uh, is not simple, yes. <laughs> uh, right, okay. Yeah, I, and also, as I briefly mentioned earlier, 
this only happens that you get an internal field proportional to the external field for certain spin liquids. You know, spin liquids have been classified in some very uh, sophisticated mathematical way. Uh, and it's for only for certain symmetry uh, and topological properties do you get this to happen. Uh, the simplest ones don't do it, but there are ones that do. And uh, okay, so why is that type of simple spin liquid being preferred? I don't know the answer to that, but I would say, again, I just refer back to the fractional quantum hall effect where <laughs> this simple thing seems to happen. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's really useful, um, Sabir, thank you. There's also a comment from Piers in the chat. So saying in, in ruthenium chlorate, the magnetic field is applied parallel to the honeycomb spin planes. This is entirely perplexing at present. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't have much to say about this because I'm not, um, I'm, I haven't done these experiments myself. So yes, there are mysteries. <laughs> I, I, I suspect what it means. Yeah, I, I don't think we know the right model. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what to say more than that. Okay, we have an, another couple of comments in the chat. Um, if the people leaving their comments want to unmute themselves, they may feel free to do so, otherwise I'll read out. So, um, sure. so Magna um, has a... Yeah, I was just wondering that in this, in the, you, you, you talked about the uh, floating zone versus aluminum flux prone, and uh, in, so you ruled out aluminum flux being an impurity. So in the floating zone samples, what is the main impurity that uh, one should be thinking about to rule out any impurity uh, driven physics? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think the likely main impurity is from deficiency of samarin or boron, which would give you vacancies. Um, that, so I think that there's two reasons. So the disadvantages of floating zone compared to flux grown are probably twofold. So one, they have to be done at very high temperatures. And I think this makes it more likely for there to be um, deficiencies from say evaporation. So I think that would likely be the main impurity. Um, in general, it is also grown from a single seed and you have growth of a single large um, crystal. So it's also possible there would be more strain effects compared to say flux grown crystals in which there's spontaneous nucleation. Um, yeah, so I would say that um, in principle, one could say have metallic patches, but from NMR, we see that um, there don't appear to be regions that are different from other regions. But yeah, that would be what I would think of as maybe the um, potential uh, things we need to worry about for floating zone purposes. That's a good question. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have a further um, question for Medici Panigrahi. The, the last question. Um, so does this mean that application of magnetic fields somehow converts Majorana excitations into spin-on excitations in the ruthenium chlorate? Um, I don't think so. I can let either Sabir or Pia's answer. I don't think so. I think that there are two separate theories being proposed. And in one, the type of neutral excitation is a Majorana fermion. And in the other, the type of neutral excitation being proposed is uh, spin on. Um, and I think the suggestion from Sabir was that maybe in ruthenium trichloride, uh, spin ons are the origin of the Fermi surface. Um, I think Piers was discussing the possibility of a Fermi surface from Majorana fermions. I don't think um, there was the mention of Majorana fermions being converted into spin ons as far as I know. Oh, maybe I can comment. Um, yeah. the, so of course, in deuterium chloride, there's very strong spin orbit and, and that's you know, very important for the Kitaev Myron or Fermion model. Uh, but I think the, there's also another distinction, uh, which is that uh, 
to have an internal field that matches the external magnetic field, you need an emergent gauge field, which is U1. And the Majorana model of uh, Kitev only has a Z2 gauge field. Uh, now, however, there have been numerical studies by Nandini Trivedi and also by Simone Trebst uh, of the ruthenium chloride model. And they have found regimes, albeit not where the experiment is, uh, they found regimes where there is a U1 spin liquid. So basically, I, the more important distinction is between U1 spin liquids and Z2 spin liquids uh, to get the right magnetic field effect. Okay, any further questions or comments? I think with that, we should thank Suchitra for a fascinating and provocative talk. Thank you. And we will reconvene again at 2 p.m. tomorrow UK time for um, Sabir's talking. And could anyone remind me who else is talking to me? We have the schedule somewhere. Uh, well, I'm the second speaker. Yeah. The second speaker and um, no, I don't know. Uh, Elena Gatti in the morning. Ah, yes. Elena, uh, Elena Gatti. Sorry. Yes. yes. yes.